Today, we'll uh, finish up a few things on energy, mainly efficiency, that I didn't get to discuss. And then we'll uh, shoot things. Projectile motion. And I'd like to welcome my uh, new friend, Dewey, to, to our class. He's sitting in today. He designed and built a Tesla coil. Makes big sparks. Or it will someday, right? We're working on it. Okay. What is it that causes a change in motion? A force. Very good. Which law defines that? Newton's second law. Very good. F equals MA. Good. What is it that causes a change in momentum? An impulse. And that's a force and a... What's an impulse is force times... It didn't sound so confident. Time. Yeah, impulse is force times time. Because you have to apply that force for a certain amount of time. And remember, if you apply it for a short time then you're going to need a big force for the same change in momentum, same impulse. But if you extend that force over a longer time, you can use less force. So a force causes a change in motion. Impulse causes a change in momentum. What causes a change in energy? What would make something change its energy? Very good. Woo! <laughs> yeah, work. Uh, I think I told you, uh, I used to think of work as another form of energy. You know, it's me pushing. I don't need more. It, it's more, it's a transfer of energy. It's a way to cause somebody's energy to change. Either uh, location, because you lift something up, you've changed its position. Which energy does that change? Potential energy is the energy associated with location, position. Gravitational potential energy is specific to the force of gravity, so up and down. So this ball relative to the table has zero gravitational potential energy. I do work on it to change its energy. And it now has more gravitational potential energy. And the other one is uh, you can change its, mo uh, yeah, its motion, its speed. You know, I can throw it up. Not only did I change its gravitational potential energy, but I changed its kinetic energy, its energy of motion. Right now it's not moving. Zero kinetic energy. But now it has velocity, and so it has kinetic energy. Except where? Where in this path does it not have kinetic energy? The very top. Remember, right at the top, it stops moving for an instant. Its velocity is zero for a moment. So it has no kinetic energy. But, just a second, Brian, but what does it still have at the top? It has no velocity, but it still has acceleration, potential. There's still a force acting on it. That's why it comes back down. Good. Yes, Brian. Something in motion has kinetic energy. Yeah, it's, if it's moving, it has kinetic energy. And that requires work. It requires work to get something moving initially or to change how fast it's going already. Back to Newton's first law. You'll have to apply a force to change its motion. When you apply that force, you will change its motion, its momentum, and its energy. In most cases, I'm sure there's some, yeah. Okay. So I was trying to make that connection. I, I love it when there's, you know, the same principle for one thing. It kind of conceptually applies to another. So change in motion, force. Change in momentum, impulse. Change in energy, work. Work done on it or work done by it can change its energy. We'll see work again in energy more in thermodynamics, those two chapters.
efficiency then. We ended with simple machines last time. Uh, we had levers, which just redirect it. You can tip on one side and make it move on another. So you can change the distance that you move something through. If you're willing to move it a farther distance, you don't have to apply as much force to have the same work. We saw that. So on one side of a lever, you can exert a lot of force over a little distance, or vice versa. And lots of times when we're moving things, we can't do that physically. So we use a simple machine to help us so we can do it. But simple machines can't magically multiply energy. That's a, that's a no-no. They do multiply force. They can change the force required. But something has to give. That's the distance. But the product will stay the same because energy is nature's way of keeping things fair and even. You can't create extra or destroy. Just change forms. Move it around. Yeah. Isn't that how hydraulics work, though? Yes, that is how hydraulics work. Do you remember your question, Brian? Last time you asked about hydraulic lifts. And we'll study this in more depth with fluids. But the, the idea is, yeah, the same energy input here is what you'll get out here. It has to be. By changing the area and dealing with the pressure, you can change the amount of force on these. Thus, if the force is different, they'll move different distances too to have the same amount of work. So you can push less on one side, but you'll have to move it, push it farther to lift something heavy a small distance. That just uses the Pascal's principle to transmit equal pressure throughout the fluid and allows it to work. But it's still this, this concept we're on right now. So these machines can be more efficient or not. If they're 100% efficient, then that means everything you put in is what you get out. If not, then we say it's less efficient, less than optimal. And that formula that I wrote up last time and didn't get to, Efficiency. Oh, let's do it here. I usually like just EFF because I don't want to write it out every time. <laughs> and that is the energy out divided by the energy in. And you don't have to write the delta signs every time. But technically, it's because energy is changing. Work's been done on or by a system. Me on one side of a lever, and it does work on something else over here. So if you put in 100 joules of work, and you get 100 joules out, do you see that the, this would be 100%? It's a ratio. If you put in 100 joules, and you only get 50% out, how many joules do you get? 50 joules. That's how this equation guides our thinking. Most machines, unfortunately, aren't very efficient. Like a car, it's way less than 50%. Where does most of that energy go? Total energy is conserved, but how come we don't get it out? It comes out as waste. And what forms? You, you even know it. Thermal energy is the biggest waste, yes. And sometimes sound is a form of energy. So if it makes a big loud noise, some energy went out that way. Light is a form of energy. Electromagnetic radiation. So that can have, a, especially like in a chemical reaction or explosion, some energy can go away from our system in the form of light, thus leaving less in our system. And so it looks like we get less out. And we do for our system. So we say it's not 100% efficient. But the total energy is still conserved. It's just in these forms we can't utilize. Thermal waste is the biggest problem. Yes? Some obviously more than others, and that's why they don't make 
that is part why they're so inefficient cars. The roads aren't great. The cars aren't great. <laughs> the conditions aren't great. And so, yes, a lot of energy is wa wasted, in quotes. We say it's wasted or energy was lost. It's still there. It's just now in thermal energy that we can't get back. But the biggest problem is the uh, internal combustion engine. And uh, thermodynamics dictates that you'll never get 100% out. Something's always got to be converted to waste. <coughs> Heat. And they run hot, and so we just can't convert 100% of it to work. Something's always going to de decrease in energy. That's, that's for later. But that's how you find efficiency. It is that simple. I will note now, so it'll help us later. This is useful energy. And that just simply means it's the stuff we can use. Thus, if it, some of that energy that came out is in the form of thermal energy, heat, well, that's not useful to us, at least all of it. You can use some of it to warm you up, but some of it's still going to escape. So this is not including those things that escape our system. So it's just useful energy. But this is the total. Everything you put in. A lot of people think these uh, magic machines are out there. Perpetual motion? Uh, nobody's found one yet. And it's usually because they overlook something that's being put in that they don't account for. Oh, wait, there's a battery. That's energy. Oh, wait, you pushed on it. Well, you did work. If you have to keep doing that, maybe gravity. Yes? A, a perpetual motion machine does go against thermodynamics. Yeah, according to the laws of thermodynamics, you can't have a perpetual motion machine. Because what that says is you're getting energy out without putting energy in because it just keeps going and we know that can't happen and you have to be applying a force to change its motion to keep it moving that requires work where did it come from if you're not putting anything in then all these dissipative forces that make it non-useful will eventually slow the thing down and stop it so yeah theoretically it can't exist because all this comes back to the law of conservation of energy. You can't get in more, you can't get out more than you put in. They're always going to be balanced. And now you already know, you know, more kind of like the second law. You can't even break even because some of it's going to be wasted in heat. All right. Now we can shoot things. We're almost ready for shooting, but I want to uh, probe you, get your clickers out, and let's see if you're getting this. So, friendly reminder, uh, Monday, if I don't finish anything, but I'll sh I should get through most of it, we'll review. So, please bring questions, concerns, problems you have, because your test on this stuff is on Wednesday. Doesn't like me today, I guess. <laughs> If it, can, it can tell it's a Friday, too. <laughs> uh, 
All right, in the bottom right is your session ID number, so you guys can log in. 840949 Really So, who's got great plans for the weekend? I'm going to go to a daddy-daughter dance tonight. My daughter is uh, 12 years old, and I'm very grateful she still wants to go with me. Hallelujah. Okay. Polling is now open. So you double the speed, no, no, increasing the speed doubles the momentum. What's that do to the kinetic energy? Momentum gets doubled. What's that do to kinetic energy? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And oh, you guys are split between B and C. Doubles or more than doubles? Okay, how do you find momentum? What's the equation the guides are thinking? Mass times velocity. Good. What's kinetic energy's equation? One half times the mass times the velocity squared. So if you double the momentum for the same object, what do you think happened to the velocity? Dub it more than doubles? It should double because momentum's mv. So if you double the momentum, for the same object, you haven't changed its mass, you've doubled its velocity. It's going twice as fast. You with me? So far. Okay, if you double its velocity, what happens to its kinetic energy? It's V squared. So if you up it by a factor of two, it's that two squared. So that your kinetic energy would actually go up four times. Does that make sense? So in this case, it's more than doubles is the correct answer. What if you triple the velocity? What happens to the kinetic energy? It more than triples, but we know exactly how much. Three squared, nine times the kinetic energy. You can think of that too. If a car is moving along, coming along at a certain speed, has a certain momentum, certain kinetic energy, and it hits the brakes, it's going to take work done by friction to slow the car down and it'll, it'll stop. That work done by friction changes its kinetic energy. Well, if a car comes in with twice the kinetic energy, it's going to require twice the change to stop it, won't it? So it'll take twice the work. If it's the same car, it would have to be going you can figure out the speed. You know, this is getting a little befuddled in your heads, isn't it? My, my point is, remember, kinetic energy is proportional to velocity squared. There's that square term. 
Don't let that throw you off. Where'd it go? I wanted it. Yeah, that one. There it was. Okay, this is a pulley system. It gives you the forces on the two sides and a distance for one side. So what would the distance be on the other side? Your key here is, uh, oh, simple machine, energy is conserved, we're doing work. So she only has to pull 20 newtons of force and she's able to lift 80 something four times the, the, the weight. If she pulls a meter, how far is the weight going to move? Let's see how many people have answered. Only 11. <laughs> Might look like big scary numbers. I was trying to help. The difference in forces is four times, factor of four. That's a clue to figure out the distance differences. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and. Okay, most of you think it's C. Very good. If you can lift four times the force, then you'll have to move it four times the distance. So for everything you move, it's going to move a fourth of that. Factor of four, 25. To keep energy conserved. Same work in, same work out. Was there one more I wanted? Okay, polling's open. And I try not to be derogatory, but please don't miss this one. Because if you guys get this, you'll understand more than you know, 80% of the population. Just miss this concept. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Only 70% of you think it is C. Good. I'm a little concerned it wasn't 100, though. Please tell me. Please, please, please. Don't be embarrassed. Why did you not think it was energy? If there's any brave takers. You can see that it can multiply force. We just did that problem. You can change that. Distance, well, that was the same problem. Energy, though, it can't. Energy is conserved. It has to be. That's why when the force was big, the distance was less and vice versa. Please tell me if you're still confused. It's OK if you are. That's why we're here. Don't be embarrassed. All right. Before we put our clickers down, I'm going to do this demonstration, but I'm going to have you guys predict. Projectile motion. I'm going to shoot this wooden bullet yeah. out of here. I'll put compressed air in here, and it'll launch. As soon as it comes out up here, it's going to trip a lever. And that will release what's hanging from this electromagnet over here. So it's aimed right at a target. I'm going to fire. As soon as it comes out of the gun, aimed right at it, this object's going to drop. So I want to know three options. Will the bullet miss it because it'll be above it? Will it hit it or will it go below it? Above, hit, or below? You guys can predict. Let me open polling. Pulling open. So is it going to go above, 
first choice, hit, second choice, or below, third choice, vote. And I'll start setting it up. This is a perfect uh, hypothesis you're making. I hope you're uh, th trying to think it through, because that's where we're headed next, to understand this. We don't need that. Yeah? What's your question? Oh, why did I not paint the bullet red and the target blue? We are at the University of Utah, after all. Well, hopefully before this lecture's over, you'll s I can appease you. Okay. Oh, everybody hasn't voted. Ten, nine, eight, seven, above, hit, or below. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Two-thirds of you think it will hit. And the, other, the, biggest, the next one is you think it will be below. So a lot of, most of you don't think it will go above. Well, now we do an experiment. The fun part. Whoops. Got snagged. All right. Watch over there. Three, two, one. Right. Looks like it was a little off on the sideways. But from your angle, what did it look like? When I, what I was seeing from my side, it looked like it either just grazed it or just missed it. This kind of wobbled. Um, so I call that a hit. We'll redo it. It definitely wasn't above it, and it definitely wasn't below it. Vertically, from your angle, it probably looked like it hit it, or at least in front of it, maybe. Why is that? Because they both fall at what rate? 9.8 meters per second squared. So vertically, they're pulled down together. This one's just going straight, yes. This one's moving horizontally. But vertically, it's dropping at the same rate. So they do one of these things. Chung, chung, chung. This one, though, has a horizontal velocity where this one doesn't. Does his horizontal velocity change once he comes out of the gun? We got a yeah? Who thinks else? Who else thinks yes? Who thinks no? Okay, I want to see if you just weren't voting. Sure, so between out of the gun and before it hits, its velocity isn't changing. There's a little bit of air resistance, but that didn't slow it down much. Because after it's released, there's no horizontal force acting on it, is there? So its inertia just keeps it going horizontally. And so it'll cover the same distance. It'll go chink, 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 the same amount each second, right? because it's a constant velocity. But with each of those seconds, it comes over horizontally, chink, and drops. Same amount horizontally, chink, drops further. Chink, and more. You with me? Let's shoot it again. Okay, Brian, we are at the U. In physics, there's lots of textbooks. This is a classic problem. They call it the monkey hunter 
problem. Because there's a hunter over here, and I don't know why, but he's shooting at a monkey up in a tree. But the monkey's smart. And so the question goes, the monkey lets go as soon as he sees the hunter fire. That's what we're trying to do here. As soon as the bullet comes out, he's going to drop and let go. Monkey thinking, oh, the bullet will miss me then. But the bullet is dropping also. Well, Cosmo's not as smart as a monkey, so let's see if we can hit him. Let me ask you, what would be different if I shoot this faster? It would have more momentum. Good. And result-wise, what do you think? Would it still hit? It would still hit. It just hit it sooner because its horizontal velocity is faster. So they'd have less time to fall. So it would be more like and hit here. What if it was shooting slower? It might hit down here. But they'll still hit because they're still falling at the same rate for the same amount of time. There, my teaching moment to stall while this thing stops wiggling. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. <laughs> Bam! We got him. That was a good one. <laughs> I think Cosmo lost his eyeballs a long time ago. All right, one more time. We're going to change things up again. We'll put it back in, and we'll, we might as well shoot Cosmo. My predecessor, the guy I replaced that does all the lecture demonstrations, he was pretty proud. He, uh, he went to BYU on campus, bought Cosmo at the bookstore, got a ticket because he parked where he wasn't supposed to, didn't pay it. And was very proud of that. He we have a photocopy of his of his uh, uh, citation. He, he was proud of that. So this time, amongst this mess over here, let's change the angle. Now we don't know if it'll hit or not. What do you think? Yeah, the bear still drops straight, but the bullet is going to go up first. It is still aimed right at the bear, cougar, sorry. But so. We'll do it the fast version. Who thinks it'll still hit? Quite a few of you. Who thinks it's different now? This matters. It won't hit. How come? Since you're less than the others. You know, you just want to be. All right. You're like, hurry up. I'm, I've been recording here. I'll count. <laughs> okay. Well, let's just do it and see what happens. Has it stopped wiggling enough? The reason I don't want it to wiggle sideways is inertia. If this thing's wiggling like this, and it's pointing, say, towards you when it shoots, well, inertia says it continues in a straight line, right, the bullet? But if that guy's swinging when he drops, he might drop, and they might be off horizontally. We don't want that excuse. If they're going to fall together, we want to see them hit in, in the same plane. So I'm trying to keep it from swinging like this. Okay, three, two, one, 
Fire! Boom! Still works. You're right. Very good. Well, that's the, the crux of what I want you to know in Chapter 10. Projectile motion. And a couple others I'll do. I've already mentioned when you do two-dimensional problems, because you've got two motions going on here, you treat them independently as two separate one-dimensional problems. And then it's not confusing. So again, that guy has horizontal velocity, constant velocity. So he travels the same distance horizontally as he would if it was the same speed rolling on the table. If this ball had the same velocity coming out as the bullet does, then they would both get over to here in the same amount of time. Do you agree? But this one's not falling. This one is. So to, to look at that, separate it from the horizontal, and you just look at the force pulling on it. It's gravity, and so they fall together. Let's do this one. Just change it up a little. I have a little ball that I can spring load in this cart. We'll turn it on. It's battery powered. And the way it works is, if I plunge it down, it's cocked. I just did work on it. It's now storing energy in what form? Potential. When uh, a little thing back here on my side gets blocked by this, or anything, it shoots and releases it. And the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. And then that thing gains gravitational potential energy. And then it falls, converts back to kinetic, lands somewhere like this. Boink. So it shoots straight up. So what I'm going to do is move it along like this. When it gets to here, it's going to shoot straight up. So when I do this, where will the ball land? Behind the cart, in the cart, in front of the cart. But it shoots straight up. What? Right here. Give me more. Something about inertia. So why doesn't it just go like this? What has momentum? The car and the ball. It's like you and your car, right? They both have a horizontal velocity, don't they? So at this point, they both have a horizontal velocity. If at that moment we now give the ball a vertical velocity, it feels two things acting on it. And which way will it go? It'll go that way and thus be a projectile motion and shoot. But it has to go up first. That takes time and come back down. Where will the cart be in that amount of time? Well, it had this velocity, correct? How does that horizontal velocity of the cart compare to the horizontal velocity of the ball? They're the same. So horizontally, they should go the same distance, right? Drum roll, please. Humor me. All right. Ta da. Very good reasoning. Very good. Okay, I got to make it a challenge, though. Yeah. <laughs> Just another way to visualize this. I can load a spring. And I'm going to put a block in the front that it will exert a force on and accelerate it that way. This one's kind of fun. It has a hole in the middle. I'm going to put on the rod. So when I release the spring, the rod goes chink to your, your left. It'll push this one. 
and come out from inside this one. Inertia keeps it in place. So this one should fall straight down. At the same time, this one has a horizontal velocity. And you expect what to happen. One, two, three. They hit the table at the same time, even though one is moving horizontally. I'll shoot it faster and do it again. How do I shoot it faster? I bet somebody knows. It needs more force. How is this going to give it more force? More work, absolutely. It's stored in the spring, so I had to compress the spring further. There's more potential energy stored in the spring now because I've cocked it further. Very good. One, two, three. They still hit at the same time. That one just made it further before it hit. And last one. Where'd it go? Thank you. So I remember you talking about an example of when you had a barrel of a gun, and then you know, the, you know, the gun, and then you were shooting the marshmallows. Yep. And the one that was in the barrel, you know, closer to your mouth, went further than the one near the barrel. Yeah, the marshmallows, the one at the end of the gun didn't go as far. The one near my mouth did go further. Because I applied the same force to both, the one closest to my mouth was able to feel that force for a longer time. It was in the barrel longer. Thus, same force times a bigger time, I, I applied a bigger impulse to it. how the forces compare. Here, it exerts a force horizontally only and just shoots it out at some speed, any speed. Here, it's inertia. It's pulling the tablecloth out from underneath. And so it feels no horizontal force from the spring. It just, it's, all of a sudden, the post isn't there and it's free to fall. At the same time, the other one's shot, just so it's synchronous. And lastly then, something I think's cool, Again, spring loaded, I put a ball in here, cock it, potential energy. When I release it, it does work on it, and here we go. See how far it goes? There. It went about here. So the ball came out with a horizontal and a vertical component of velocity, correct? Do it again. See how close I am. Huzzah. What I want to do, that was at 30 degrees here. I'm going to change it to 60 degrees. What do you think will happen? I'm going to aim it up higher. It has more vertical velocity. Shorter distance. So you think it'll land in front of it? I'll cock it the same. We're going to give it the same amount of work, energy. So it's shooting it with the same force. It comes out with the same initial. Ready? You missed it. I know. <laughs> Helps if you're at 60 degrees like I wanted. <laughs> there was a, a famous Australian physicist, kind of like Mr. Wizard or Bill Nye, and he'd always say, that didn't work the way we did. We did not meet the, the strict demands of nature and the laws. I wasn't quite at 60 degrees. Now I am. Ready? It's okay. We know why. Ideally, if the angles add up to 90 degrees, 30 and 60, 
or 75 and 15, they land in the same spot. If uh, we changed it to 45, it would go further. But what I'm just emphasizing, what changes is at 30 degrees, it has more velocity horizontally. So it covers, it's going horizontally faster. So it's not in the air as long, but it covers a good distance. At 60 degrees, like this, it goes up more than it goes over. But it's in the air longer. So even though horizontally it has less velocity, it has more time to move horizontally. So ideally, they end up in there. You think it didn't work. Why did 60 not go as far? Hold on and hold on. Why did it not go as far? It was in the air for more time. Real life? Air resistance. If something's in the air more, it, air resistance, which usually is negligible, has a, more time to act. Okay. Same work because I compressed it the same, yes. And so that's controlling the tension on the spring. That does control the tension on the spring, yes. And so that controls the work on the small, how far? How much energy, how far the spring is compressed controls how much energy is stored in the spring, which controls how much work it does on the ball. So if I compress it the same every time, it should make the ball come out with the same initial velocity. The components change, but the, the main velocity stays the same. I was trying to keep that consistent. Any last minute questions? It, in that instance, if the two angles add up to 90, it works out. If I chose a different angle, it would have been different. If you have other questions, I'm going to apologize. I have to get this out of here, but I will be free to talk to anybody in 15 minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Have a great weekend.